Welcome to another tutorial video. Once again, we're going to be addressing a really good question that came into our help desk the other day, this time about the topic of discounted cash flow or DCF analysis and valuation. So here's the question. I need your help. I didn't get a chance to go over the entire course yet. I'm working on a discounted cash flow model and need to make sure my model is error free. Are there any sanity checks I can do or any simple ways of making sure my model isn't wrong? So this is actually a somewhat difficult question to answer because what does it really mean for a model to be wrong? It's not as if we're solving a math problem with an incorrect and a correct answer. Valuation is very subjective and two different people can have very different views of the exact same company or same deal. With that said though, there are some common problems that you definitely want to avoid in a DCF. Now, the truth is we could spend hours talking about this and the video would go on and on. But what I want to do here is give you the short version and give you three simple rules for what to avoid in a DCF. These rules correspond to, in my view, the top three mistakes that I've seen over time from candidates submitting models in case studies on the job, all sorts of different contexts. So I'm going to give you those three rules first, then we're going to go into Excel and learn how we can look at a simple DCF analysis and diagnose what might be going wrong, and then see how we can apply those rules that I'm going to give you to fix what is going wrong in this particular analysis. So the first common problem is to have too much of a company's present value coming from the present value of its terminal value. Remember that in a DCF analysis, you really have two components, the terminal value and the present value of a company's terminal value, and then a company's free cash flows and the sum of the present value of those free cash flows. And together, they make up the company's implied enterprise value or implied equity value, depending on how it's set up from this analysis. And you can see here that around 78 or 79% is coming from the present value of the terminal value in this case. So in other words, what a company is worth after five years or 10 years or however long the projection period is discounted back to its value today. And ideally this should really be more like 50 to 60% or less. Now it's not the end of the world if it goes above that, but if it's something like 80 to 90%, if you sit back and really think about it, why even bother with the DCF? If the present value of the terminal value is 90% of a company's implied value, you might as well just value it with a multiple or a simple growth rate and skip the DCF altogether. Why even bother projecting all the cash flows in between because they don't really contribute that much value in the first place. So it's a bit silly when you get up to a level that's that high and it makes the analysis a bit irrelevant. So ideally we would like this to be more like 50 to 60% or even less than that, depending on the company and industry. Now, the second common problem is checking to make sure that the implied long-term growth rate and the implied terminal multiple make sense. One thing that people often overlook in a DCF is that when you calculate the terminal value using the multiples method, so you take a company's final year EBITDA, for example, and then you apply a multiple based on the comparables or comparable transactions or something like that, you can actually then calculate the implied growth rate based on that terminal value what the final year free cash flow is, and then what the discount rate you're assuming is. Now, we don't have time to get into the algebra and logic for this here. We covered it in one of the previous lessons somewhere, but you can back into this and figure out what type of growth rate these assumptions correspond to. And if you calculate the terminal value with the long-term growth rate method, you can do the same thing for the multiple. And there it's easy because you can just take the baseline terminal value that you've calculated with that growth rate and the discount rate and the final year free cash flow. And you can simply divide by the company's final year EBITDA, which is listed down here, and get to the implied multiple like that. And what people often do is they pick arbitrary numbers for these and they never bother to check the implied growth rate or the implied multiple to do some cross checking and make sure it makes sense. So here, for example, the median multiple for the comparables is 7x, but we've picked 8x. And the country that we're in, the US in this case, because it's this US-based steel company, Steel Dynamics, the GDP is expected to grow at 3.5%, but the implied growth rate here is 4.8%, and the growth rate we've picked is 4.8% as well. So 
If we have a situation like that, or something even more extreme, like a long-term growth rate of 10%, but GDP growth of only 3%, or we have a multiple implied that is 10x, but the comps trade at 8x, then you have a problem and you need to go in and make adjustments. And then the third problem is double counting items. The rule for this one is pretty simple. If you have an item included in free cash flow, you do not want to include it in the enterprise value to equity value calculations at the end. So when you get to a company's implied enterprise value, as we do here, to get to its implied equity value, you do the opposite of the normal calculation and you add cash and subtract debt. You add any other cash like items, you subtract other debt like items. But the tricky part is that if an item and the associated income or expenses with that item have been factored into free cash flow down here, you do not want to include that item at the end because you've already included it in the free cash flow projections. So if you included it, you'd be double counting that item. And vice versa, if the item is not included in free cash flow, then you do want to include it at the end. So in this example, as you can see, we are leaving out interest income and interest expense completely. And that's fine here because at the end, we are adding cash and subtracting debt. So we're getting the items that correspond to interest income and interest expense. But if we left this out, the calculation would be completely wrong. Now that's a pretty obvious example, but oftentimes here, you see problems with pension expenses and people including or leaving out the unfunded pension obligation. And you see problems with restructuring obligations and the restructuring expense and other things like that that get a bit more advanced. So when you figure out that you have a problem, there are a couple of things you can do to fix it. First off, you can extend the projection period to more like 10 to 15 years instead. A lot of DCF analyses have projection periods of five years, but in a lot of cases, that's actually too short to be useful. And to really get better numbers, you have to go further out. Now, people will dismiss this and say, you can't predict the future. You don't know what's going to happen in 10 to 15 years. Those arguments are not really valid because business owners and management teams do think that far out. When they invest in something or they take an initiative or they acquire a company, they are thinking that far ahead into the future. No one is going to do something because it makes their business more valuable in two years. They're thinking about the long-term picture. And as an investor, you should also be thinking about the long-term picture. Another way to fix this is to reduce the terminal value by using a lower long-term growth rate or a lower terminal multiple. That's an easy way to fix this problem. And in this case, it would be a pretty simple way to fix at least part of this problem because we're so far off from the comparables and also from the expected GDP growth rate. And then a third way to fix this is to increase the discount rate. This will have a disproportionate impact on the present value of the terminal value in most cases, and it's going to reduce the contribution from that. Now, you have to be a little bit careful when doing this because you don't want to go in and just say, let's change our discount rate to 15% now and look at this. Because as you can see here, it doesn't really change that much. We still get a 77% contribution from it. And now we have a discount rate that we probably can't justify that well. So keep it in mind and think about maybe modifying the discount rate if you need to do so and if it makes sense, but it's probably not the best way to fix these types of problems in most cases. Now that we've been over the problems and the solutions, let's take a look at this Excel file and see firsthand how to actually fix it. As I mentioned before, the diagnosis here is pretty simple. The long-term growth rate and terminal multiple, the implied terminal multiple are out of line. We have two high of a contribution from the present value of the terminal value. We're not double counting anything. It looks like that is correct based on the information we have here. But as I said, sometimes you do see problems with more advanced items, which are absent from this model. So to solve this problem, the first solution will be to reduce the long-term free cash flow growth rate and to reduce the terminal EBITDA multiple. Let's go over here and see what happens when we actually do that. So the comparables are trading at around 7x. So let's try changing this to 7x. And now we still have a 76% contribution from the present value of terminal value. Our implied free cash flow growth rate is still around 4%, which is faster than the economy as a whole is growing. Now, if we go even lower, let's change this to 6.5%. Now we get down to 3.5%. 
but we could make a good argument for putting this at an even lower number because generally speaking, the multiples for comparables do decline a bit over time as companies get bigger and their growth rates slow down. Not always, there are exceptions. And again, depending on the industry you're in and the stage of the companies, sometimes multiples increase, especially if you're in a cyclical industry, for example. But for our purposes here, I'm gonna peg this at 6X and our implied long-term free cash flow growth rate is 3%. Let's also fix it for the perpetuity method and we'll set this to 3%. We get an implied terminal EBITDA multiple of 6X. These numbers are now much more palatable. The free cash flow growth rate is below the GDP growth rate, which is what you usually want. And the terminal EBITDA multiple is below the multiple that the comparables are currently trading at. But our problem is still not completely fixed because we still have over 70% of our company's implied enterprise value coming from the present value of terminal value. So we need to fix that. To fix that, we're gonna zoom out a little bit and we're going to extend this projection period forward. So we're gonna go out 10 years instead of just five years and then see what happens. And I'm just going to change these manually to save some time. Not really a smart way to do it, but we don't care that much here. And so we can extend out the revenue, the operating income, the taxes. Now it's an open question what assumptions we should be using for all this, but I'm not too worried about that right now. I just wanna show you the concept of what it looks like to extend this out. Now for the revenue growth, we probably wanna have this decline even more over time because as companies get bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder for them to grow at the same rate. So I'm gonna put this at 2.5%, 2.5%, 2%, 2%, and 1.5%. The margins, we can have increase slightly over time. So I'll put this at 8% going forward. So we do have a slight margin increase over time as the company gains scale. Often its margins increase a little bit due to economies of scale. Our taxes are still being calculated in the same way as is NOPAT. Depreciation and amortization, I'm still pegging at 2.5% of revenue. Our deferred income taxes are a very, very low percentage of the actual book income taxes here. And then going down to these other items at the bottom. So the change in working capital. For these, we can largely copy across the same things that we have and same thing for CapEx and the unlevered free cash flow and EBITDA. So we have this, the change in net working capital is still a percent of the change in revenue. Capital expenditures are still a percent of revenue and our unlevered free cash flow here at the end is now growing at around 2% in years nine and 10. EBITDA is now growing at around 1.5% or 2%. This actually fixes another problem because one of the other points I didn't even mention is that you also generally want the implied long-term free cash flow growth rate to be somewhat close to what this actually is in the final few years of the model. And now we're much closer. We're not at nine or 10% as we were before. We're now more at 2%, which is much closer to the 3% that we have here. So we have all that in place. Let's go in and actually fix these calculations now. So we need to change the M67 here over to R67 instead, because R column R is now year 10 in our model. And all these other references to column M, we need to change the column R. Change the M64 to R64, the M67 to R67, we have that. And we can also change this to 2.7%. The present value of terminal value, let's change the M27 to R27. And then let's change this as well. So we have that. And I just went through that very, very quickly, but it looks like everything we need to have is actually there. You can see that now the free cash flows and the present value of the unlevered free cash flow is being summed up over a wider range. The present value of the terminal value, we're using year 10 as our period now. And we're also basing it on this terminal value figure, which in turn is calculated based on the year 10 free cash flow number down there. So in short, 
if you zoom out and take a look at everything now, it looks a lot better. Only 51% of our implied enterprise value is coming from the present value of the terminal value. So that's a lot better. Our implied terminal free cash flow growth rate is 2.7%, well below the economy's growth rate of 3.5%. Our terminal EBITDA multiple of 6x is below what the comparables are trading at. And we have a 10-year projection period, which in our view is generally better than only a five-year or three-year projection period or something that short. So that's it for this lesson. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. The three main problems in a DCF are number one, too much value coming from the present value of a company's terminal value. Number two, long-term growth rates and terminal multiples implied by the analysis that don't actually make sense that are way out of line with GDP growth rate or what comparables are trading at or way out of line with the company's numbers in the final years of the model. And then the third problem is double counting items, which we didn't really look at here. Now to fix these problems, you can extend the projection period. That's always a good solution. You can reduce the terminal value by using a more appropriate growth rate or terminal multiple. And if the terminal value is too low, then maybe you use a higher growth rate or a higher multiple. And then you can also increase the discount rate. And of course, if you had double counted an item, you'd fix that and not double count the item anymore. And you saw firsthand how we applied it to fix everything in this simplified DCF. So that's it for this lesson. And hopefully now you have a better understanding of some of the key problems that come up in a DCF, what to look for, how to avoid them, and how to fix them when you see them crop up in your own model.